As a New York Times bestselling author, psychotherapist, national advice columnist, and TED speaker, Lori Gottlieb brings a hilarious and thought-provoking glimpse into the therapist world, where her patients are looking for answers, and so is she. In her new book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. It's funny because this isn't the kind of thing where you wake up and you say, I'm going to write a book about myself in therapy, especially if you're a therapist. Um, it's very taboo. As a therapist, Gottlieb shares how she listens to the music under the lyrics. A therapist will hold up a mirror to you and help you to see your reflection in a way that maybe you've chosen not to or didn't even look to see. And that's what's really important. I always say that I'm listening for the music under the lyrics. So the lyrics are, here's this breakup. The music is, what is the underlying struggle or pattern that got you into this situation in the first place? How we are all unreliable narrators of our own stories. Not because we're purposely misleading, but because we see the story through our own lens. And shows us what therapy really is, debunking some myths and preconceptions along the way. People have a lot of misconceptions about what therapy actually is. And one of the things I hope to do in the book is to show by bringing people in what it is and what it's not. So today we're with best-selling author Lori Gottlieb. You are a therapist, a speaker, and um, we are just so happy to have you here. So thanks for coming to St. Louis. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I picked this book up over the summer thinking it was going to be another self-help book, but it really wasn't. How would you classify your book? Yeah, it's sort of a hybrid of things. Um, you know, in the book, I follow four very different patients. Then there's a fifth patient, and that's me as I go through my own therapy. And I really feel like in terms of self-help, a lot of people see themselves in the stories. And I think it's very helpful because I think that we are more apt to notice something about ourselves if we see it through the lens of somebody else. This book was so refreshing because I see my therapist as this you know, omniscient, infallible human, but you're all just human. That's right. In fact, I say at the very beginning of the book that my most significant credential is that I'm a card-carrying member of the human race, that if we weren't just human, we wouldn't be able to help people as effectively. So when did you decide that you, Lori, needed to be a part of this book? Well, <laughs> it's funny because this isn't the kind of the kind of thing where you wake up and you say, I'm going to write a book about myself in therapy, especially if you're a therapist. Um, it's very taboo. And, uh, you know, I really, I was supposed to be writing um, a book about happiness. And the book about happiness was making me depressed. I called it the depression, miserable depression-inducing happiness book. And I eventually decided that it didn't feel authentic. It, it didn't really capture what I was seeing, the richness of the human experience that I was seeing in the therapy room. And so I wanted, and I feel like it's a privilege that I get to see that. And so I wanted to bring readers into that world. And so originally I was going to follow my patients, um, but I realized that it would almost be disingenuous to do that because I was going through something at the time and I didn't want to be the expert up on high. I, one of the things that I hope people take away from the book is that we're all more the same than we are different. And I felt like I couldn't really get that across without showing my own humanity. I ended up falling in love with all of the, I shouldn't even say characters, but the patients in your book. Um, let's talk about John though, because at the beginning he was just intolerable. I don't wanna to give too many things away because there is quite a significant plot twist in his story, but how did you find the, the compassion and the patience for someone like that? So John is, as you said, very abrasive and unlikable in the beginning. And one of the first things he says to me is that he doesn't want his wife to know that he's come to therapy, so he's going to pay me in cash at the end of the session. And he says, you'll be just like my mistress. Um, and as, if that wasn't bad enough, then he, then he amends that. And he says, actually, you're not the kind of person I'd choose as a mistress. You'll be more like my hooker. And people say, why did you take him on? Why would you work with somebody like that? But I think that our behaviors are a way of protecting ourselves from something. They're a way of communicating something without the words. They're speaking the unspeakable. And as you see, without giving away the spoilers, um, we find out what the unspeakable is for him. So I found one major underlying theme of your book is is change and how people are so reluctant to change, even if it's a good change. Why is that? 
Yeah, people don't realize that. They think, well, I'm making a positive change, so it should be easy. Um, but change is hard because all change, even really positive change, involves loss. We're losing the familiar. Um, you know, it's, I'm getting married. That's great, but you're losing something that was familiar to you. Or I'm going to take this new job, but it's scary because there's uncertainty about it. And for really deep changes, they're so ingrained in us. The patterns and behaviors are so ingrained that we cling to the familiar, even if the familiar was miserable, because at least it's the devil we know. Yeah, so talking about change in your book, uh, you start seeing your therapist, Wendell, um, based on this, what did you call it? It's the presenting problem, right? Mm -hmm. So a breakup. Kind of go into to, to your experience with Wendell and, and how he really made you see maybe another side of your story. Right. I'm glad you brought up the presenting problem because often what people come into therapy with isn't the whole story. Um, and so in my case, I was telling him that I was supposed to get married to this person and he announced that he couldn't live with a kid under his roof for the next 10 years. And that kid was my eight year old at the time who had not been hiding in a closet the entire time we were dating. So my version of the story, and I very intentionally say my version of the story because as we sort of unpeel this, we realize I knew more than I thought I knew. Um, but my version of the story when I went in was, um, you know, I said, I've been dating him all this time and now I've wasted all these years and half my life is over. I'm in my 40s. And he gloms onto that, that phrase, half my life is over. And that ends up being what the therapy is about. It was all of this stuff that was going on that I hadn't told him initially about what was going on with me at midlife. Right. And then you also talk about idiot compassion versus wise compassion, right? So yes. we say to our friends, you know, isn't he the worst? And they're like, yeah, he's so awful. But that's not exactly the case. Right. So idiot compassion is when we go along with our friends' stories. So all of my friends were saying, you dodged a bullet. He's a sociopath. Who does this? Not just to you, but to your kid. Um, but, you know, wise compassion is what Wendell did, which is a therapist will hold up a mirror to you and help you to see your reflection in a way that maybe you've chosen not to or didn't even look to see. And that's what's really important. I always say that I'm listening for the music under the lyrics. So the lyrics are, here's this breakup. The music is, what is the underlying struggle or pattern that got you into this situation in the first place? So whenever you're dealing with a patient, I'm just curious, do you see, does it take a while for people to be, to realize that, you know, there might be another side to my story or now I'm seeing my reflection in the mirror and does it vary with gender? Does it vary with experience? Just what have you experienced with that? I think that we are all unreliable narrators, and not because we're purposely misleading, but because we see the story through our own lens. Mm -hmm. And so what we leave in, what we leave out, the parts of the story that we tell, um, you know, whose perspective we're telling it from. I see a lot of couples in my practice, and you can see the, the different stories when you see one person tell a series of events and the other person describing the same series of events and they have completely different ideas about what had happened. And in your TED Talk, which everybody should watch, you you read two stories from two different points of view of the same couple. And it's, I mean, it's, it's starkly, I was aghast as a watcher just being like, you know, there are two major different things going on in these people's lives and they're just not communicating. Right. I see that a lot because I write the Dear Therapist column for The Atlantic and I've gotten letters from two people in the same scenario unbeknownst to the other and I put it together and I realize they're telling me this. They're asking for advice on the same situation but they see it completely differently. What is it like just tangentially? What is it like writing that that column for The Atlantic? How do you choose what to respond to? It's hard to choose because there are so many letters that I want to respond to. I mean, you have hundreds of letters sitting there every week, and what do you do with them? Um, but I think what's interesting is that when I'm in the therapy room, I get to ask questions. I get to explore it more. I have another week in which to go back and say, oh, now that I've thought about this in between, I want to go in this direction. With a letter, you get one shot. And again, you get one version of a story. So I have to read between the lines and say, I wonder what else might be happening here. And after having enough experience in the therapy room, I make educated guesses as to what might be going on. And a lot of people write to me after and say, I don't know how you knew that. And it's just because people are so similar. Oh, sure. You know, even though we're unique in our own makeup, that we're so similar in the ways that, you know, in terms of what we aren't saying. In the book, Julie, uh, she is a patient going through, she's battling cancer. 
And you're worried as her therapist that you might not have the same empathy for some other patients as you do for her. Let's talk about pain and, and our experience with pain. Right. So I, I like to say, and I say in the book, that there's no hierarchy of pain. And I think so many times we minimize our pain or we try to ignore it. We think it's not worthy of being discussed. But we don't do that with our physical health, right? So if we're, something feels off in our bodies, we'll go get it checked out before we have a massive heart attack. If something feels off emotionally, often we will wait, we will think, well, it's not that bad, or I'll just kind of you know, stiff upper lip. And then people come to me when they're having the equivalent of an emotional heart attack. And they don't need to suffer so much. And also it's harder to treat if you let it go that long. Like you said in your book, it's just a breakup and you're crying in your therapist's office. People do that with a lot of things. They say, oh, I had a miscarriage, but I didn't lose an eight-year-old, right? Um, you know, people are minimizing their pain all the time. You state in your book that about 30 million Americans are in therapy, and America or the U.S. isn't even the leading country We're in not. therapy, right? So why is there this stigma? I think there's stigma because people have a lot of misconceptions about what therapy actually is. And one of the things I hope to do in the book is to show by bringing people in what it is and what it's not. And some of the reasons that people might not go is they think that you're damaged, something is seriously wrong with you. Um, you know, you're all, all of a sudden people will perceive you as being broken, damaged, you're the problem. And usually in a family system, the healthiest person in the family is the one who says, I wanna go get help. Or we should go get help together, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I am so scared of being a Becca. <laughs> so <laughs> so Becca, in your book, you literally had to do jumping jacks before she came in because she was just so boring, not in the sense that she was just dull, but it, it explain to us how yeah. we, we cannot be Beccas as patients. Yeah. Well, first of all, I should say that I had the same fears going to my own therapist. I think when you go and you're so vulnerable with somebody and you're talking about yourself the whole time, um, that you worry, am I boring this person? Am I insufferable? Um, most of the time, people are not. Um, you know, the times that they're boring are when they don't let me see them. And that's what Becca did. She was hiding in plain sight from me. So every time I tried to connect with her, every time I tried to get to know her better, um, I could see why she was experiencing the problems that she was experiencing outside of the therapy room. And I tried so many different ways to get in with her. I talked to my consultation group. I, you know, I really, I really worked at this and I failed. And I take responsibility for that. I failed and I ended the treatment with her because I wasn't helping her. The, the people who are boring are, are the people where you, you're not able to connect with them. And so many people worry that, you know, if I let you see the truth of who I am, uh, you won't like me. And the opposite is true. I will be so drawn to you and I will so relate to you if you show me your humanity. And you show your humanity in the book. One such is instance is that the book is quite funny. I thought that was so refreshing, just getting to know your humanity as well. Right, right. And I think that that was really important because I think that people, on the one hand, people want therapists to be human, you know, not the brick wall who doesn't say anything. Um, but on the other hand, I, I tell a story at the beginning of the book where a colleague of mine um, was trying to get pregnant and she finally was pregnant. And then she was standing in a Starbucks when her OB called and said that the pregnancy wasn't viable. And she started crying. And a patient happened to walk in, saw her, and never came back. And so on the one hand, you want your therapist to be a person in the world. And on the other hand, you never want to see it. Right. And be a person, a, but not too much of a person. Right. Don't, don't show me your humanity. But I think it's interesting. I have a chapter in the book called Embarrassing Public Encounters, yeah. where you know sometimes we see patients, as we call it, out in the wild. But that's different from showing your humanity in the room. In the room, you're not disclosing things about yourself. You're not crossing boundaries, but you're being real. And one of the things that Wendell, my therapist, taught me, just by example, was how to bring your personality into the room and be so real and so authentic um, to deepen those relationships because that really helps your patients. So what are the guidelines whenever you see a patient out in the wild? Out in the wild, I don't say anything to them um, unless they say hello to me because maybe they're with someone and they don't want that person to know they're in therapy. Um, maybe they're on a job interview or they're with a, on a first date um, or, you know, whatever it is. So I, I really make sure that I, I keep their confidentiality sacred. 
Yeah. It still blows my mind, though, because if, I think if I saw my dentist out, I'd be like, hey, Dr. Of Spence. Of course. <laughs> well, that's the difference. And it, it works both ways. I mean, I, I talk about how when I was at a Lakers game with my son and we ran into a patient there and how, you know, now he's seeing, now I'm exposed. He's seeing me. He's seeing me with my family. Um, you know, and, and patients never see that side of us. You were exposed to to John, and it ended up bringing you closer together. I feel like you were also exposed to Julie by, you actually told Julie that you loved her. I mean, I feel like that actually just deepened your connection with your patients. Right, at one point, you know, as Julie was dying and she asked me to go through this experience with her, we formed this very, very, um, I would say, you know, just gorgeous, gorgeous and tragic relationship. And she, at one point, said to me near the time that she was dying, she said, you know, I, I love you. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was what we, you know, what we think of as this very pure kind of bond between two people. And I wasn't going to stand on professional ceremony and, and deflect. And I wasn't going to ruin that moment for her and for us. And, and so I said, I love you, too. Now, we don't, you know, it's all context, so that, that won't happen in, in other contexts most of the time. You don't tell every patient that you love them. <laughs> um, I think she's probably one of the only ones that yeah. I have, but, but I think it shows that, you know, in, in therapy, it's like if you're learning to play an instrument, like the piano, you learn the scales really well and you learn them perfectly, but then you can improvise. And I think that once you have the training and you know it really well, you know when it's appropriate to improvise and when it's not. Going to Wendell, is that your first, I know you, you interned, you have to, to go to therapy in school, but was that the first time you've been to therapy? No, no. I think when you go to therapy before you're a therapist, it's a very different experience. Yeah. Um, you know, you are just a person in the world. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, you know a lot and you're going back to therapy. And you try not to, you know, to take off your, you want to take off your therapist hat. You don't want to backseat drive. Um, but in the first session, you see where he's asking me certain questions. And I know exactly why he's asking me those questions. And I want to answer them the way that I want to be perceived as opposed to the truth of, of what those answers would be. Um, but I realized that's not going to help me. Exactly. So I didn't really realize how many caveats there were for a therapist to find a therapist. I mean, you kind of had to jump through hoops to find Wendell. Yeah, it was like water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink, <laughs> um, because I'm surrounded by therapists. But I can't go to anybody with whom I have a pre-existing relationship. So if they're a colleague, if they're in my consultation group, if they're um, a friend, I, I can't go to any of those people. So some of the best therapists that I knew in town were people that I could not see. I thought it was also cool to see that you have, I mean, you have these happy hours with your colleagues, you you banter, you talk. As patients, we never get to see that side. Right. I think it's important because I think in almost every other job, somebody sees your work, mm -hmm. whether it's a tangible work product or they see what you've done um, or they're interacting with you during the day. We're alone in a room with our patients. Mm -hmm. Um, and so nobody says, like, at minute 22, that was a brilliant intervention, right? There's nobody to do that. Um, but at the same time, there's also nobody to say, like, at minute 22, I would have done this. Mm -hmm. um, here's something that you can try because that didn't work. And so it's really important for us to have checks and balances and to make sure that we are doing what we need to be doing. If we're stuck, we get help. So. Most people, most therapists belong to consultation groups where they present their cases and they get feedback. And one point in your book, you were talking about how one of your colleagues said, we don't move at the speed of light, we move at the speed of want. About our culture of this instant gratification, medication, we now have therapists on our mobile phones. Mm -hmm. How has that affected therapy for you or your practice? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, that was during our internship, and it was our supervisor as we were all sort of trying to speed through our internship. And she said, what does it matter what age you are when you get licensed? You're going to turn that age anyway. Right. Um, and then she said, you know, nobody moves at the speed of, of light. Everybody just moves at the speed of want. Or she said, the speed of light is outdated. Everybody moves at the speed of want. Right. Um, and I think it's true. I've had to tell lots of people not to use their phones in therapy. And therapy is, is this really a unique place, I think, in modern culture because we don't have a lot of opportunity to sit face to face with another person for 50 minutes straight with no distractions, mm -hmm. nothing pinging or ringing or vibrating, um, nothing to respond to. 
and to sit in the same physical space too. So many people will say, well, can I just Skype so they don't have to, you know, come to the office? And a colleague of mine called Skype Therapy, she said, it's like doing therapy with a condom on. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's such an apt metaphor because there's something very different about sharing physical space with somebody, the way you can hear them breathe, you're sharing the sounds in the room, you're sharing all of the the visceral, um, you know, what you see, what you hear, um, how it smells, all of that. And you can't, you know, I think when something's mediated by a screen, you can look away, you can look at something, there's a way to distance yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that when we move at the speed of want, we miss out on this vital way of connecting that used to be so organic to people. I was going to ask you the difference between um, men and women in your practice. And if you see any differences, to me, the first thing that comes to mind is vulnerability, but I'm sure there's others. Yeah, yeah. One of the, I think, most stark differences that I've seen, and again, as a generalization, is a lot of times men will come in and they'll say, I've never told anybody this before. And then what they tell me feels so mild. And I, I have so much compassion for them because I feel like, wow, they have nobody in the world that they could say this to. And it doesn't feel that vulnerable to me. Mm -hmm. Women will come in and they'll say, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother or my sister or my best friend, right? So they have maybe one to three people that they could say it to. And usually what they say is, I, I can see why they felt vulnerable. I can see why they felt a lot of shame around that. Um, more so than what I think men say. And yet, men and women are so similar. Um, they have similar fears, desires, regrets, insecurities, vulnerabilities, um, questions about life, um, relationships with their parents, with their siblings, with their spouses. Um, you know, it's, it's all the same. And they just don't get to talk about it anywhere else. Why do you think that is? Is that a, just a societal expectation that, you know, that whole man up type well, situation? Well, I'll tell you or... something interesting about that. When I see couples, a lot of times, if I'm seeing a heterosexual couple and the woman comes in and she says, you know, I really want you to be vulnerable with me. You don't tell me what you're thinking. I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know you. Mm -hmm. So the guy opens up and he tells her something and he maybe starts crying a little bit. Mm -hmm. She's frozen. She does not know what to do with this, and she's profoundly uncomfortable. Oh. And all of a sudden, it's like, I thought I wanted that, but I didn't really want to see you break down and cry, right? So it made me feel unsafe to see you break down and cry, even though it also made me know you better. So there is this double standard where I think that we say to men, yes, it's safe. We want you to, to be vulnerable, and then we sometimes aren't able to deal with their vulnerability. So what was the process like writing this book? How did you choose your patients? I read your author's note. You said that actually some of them are amalgamations of multiple patients. Um, how did you keep them anonymous? Just explain to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, so keeping them anonymous was probably the hardest part um, because of the age of the internet. Mm -hmm. So any little detail had to be changed. There was one point in the book where I Google stalked my own therapist and I find a Yelp review. And I this, this woman who wrote these Yelp reviews was extremely critical of, of everyone and everything. And, and they were very funny um, because she eventually realizes probably through her therapy with my therapist um, that she's extremely critical. Yeah. And because you see the Yelp reviews getting kinder after she gives him a five star review. And so um, and so one of her reviews was about she was on vacation and she was on this beach and she stepped on and I can't say what she stepped on, but it was the funniest thing ever. And I could not say it because you could easily Google what it was. So I changed it to a rock. Oh. And I use that to illustrate for you how much I had to change about my actual patients. I, I didn't have any obligation to hide her identity. Um, but um, but then if I if she became identifiable, then my therapist would become identifiable and then it just snowballs. Um, and so I had to change all kinds of details like that. Mm -hmm. But I think that the spirit of each story is very is very true. Um, you know, there's nothing in there that didn't happen. It's just that the details were changed. I was dying to know who John was. Everybody is dying to know who John was. And you will never know because, we'll never know because that was such a rigorous process of hiding his identity. You've really come full circle because you started out in the entertainment industry. 
Describe to me the beginning of your career, if you will. Right. So it looks like I've done all these disparate things, but actually I feel like they're all related because I feel like everything that I've done has been related to story and the human condition. And so when I graduated from college, I worked in film development, and then I moved over to NBC the year that um, ER and Friends premiered. So it was the, the beginning of their reign of musty TV. Um, I'm dating myself here, but um, but it was it was it was a really exciting time to be in television. And because I was working on ER, I would spend a lot of time in a real ER with our consultant on the show, you know, for research. Mm -hmm. But then it became more than research; it became an obsession. And I felt like the stories that were being told on ER were these like really rich human stories. But I felt like the real ones were just they 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 had an, an effect on me that was different. Um, you know, nobody ends up in an ER because you expected something to happen. It's an inflection point for a lot of people. And so the consultant said to me, you know, I think that maybe you like it better here in the ER than you like your day job. And eventually I did go to medical school. And when I went to medical school, um, it was the advent of managed care. And I was hearing a lot about how I wouldn't get to spend time with my patients in the way that I wanted to. And so I left to become a journalist. And I was a journalist and I still am a journalist. Um, for a long time, and then I had a baby. And for anybody who's who's been a parent, a new parent, they may recognize this. But I, I really needed to have adult humans to talk to during yeah. the day. And so I called up the dean at the medical school, and I said maybe I should come back and be a psychiatrist. It got to the point at home where the UPS guy would come with packages, and I would he would you know I, I would always say like try to detain him just to have conversation with somebody. You know how about those diapers? Mm -hmm. And do you have kids? And um, and so he would like tiptoe to my door and gently place the package down so that I would not know he was there and he wouldn't have to talk to me. <laughs> and that's when I called the dean at Stanford and I said, maybe I should come back and do psychiatry. And she said, you're going to be prescribing medicine all day. You're going to do medication management and that's not what you want to do. So you're welcome to come back, but I think you should get a graduate degree in clinical psychology. And it was the best advice that anybody could have given me. And I feel like I went from telling people stories as a journalist to helping people change their stories as a therapist. I feel like a lot of what I do as a therapist is to help people edit their stories. So are your patients now, because you are, I mean, you are a writer, so what is that like for your patients? You Googled Wendell, I'm sure yeah. they can Google you pretty easily. What is that like for them? Well, it's interesting because I was a writer before I became a therapist. Yeah. So I was, and I had no idea I was going to become a therapist. So maybe some of the things I wrote, I wouldn't have written knowing that people could Google it later. Not because I'm ashamed of any of it, but just because it's a lot of information to have about your therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that anybody who comes to me probably you know, vetted me before they came in and decided they were okay with knowing whatever they, they knew, or they decided to stop Googling. They were healthier than I was and, and didn't Google stalk me. Um, people slip up a lot too, though. You know, people will say in the therapy room, oh, you know, because you grew up in Los Angeles. And I never said where I grew up. Or they'll say, you know, because you have a kid in middle school. It's like, I never mentioned that in the therapy room. But you've come full circle because now this book is being turned into a series on ABC. Right. Eva Longoria's company is producing it, and the, the people who created the show, The Americans, oh. are creating the show. That's really exciting. What's your role on that as consultant, writer, producer? I'm a producer on the show. That's really exciting. And I also heard that you're starting a podcast with Katie. I am, yes. Um, so Katie Kirk is executive producing it. It's going to be for iHeart, and I'm doing it with Guy Winch, who is, you may have heard his very popular TED Talks. He is going to be the advice columnist for TED. I'm the advice columnist for The Atlantic. And we are joining forces to have this podcast where we have two therapists slash advice columnists um, bringing that to, uh, to the, the podcast world. Mm -hmm.